Statistics are all around us. We're used to reading the news or hearing the radio and coming across numbers. So we might hear things like the crime rate, the level of poverty, the latest hospital waiting times. We'll hear about the economy growing or shrinking by minuscule amounts. And when we hear these numbers, we tend to trust them. We tend to see numbers in general as a very solid and reliable form of evidence because we assume that if someone's gone to the trouble of counting and calculating something, that they've done it properly, and that they're confident in that number, and you can be too. Now, I have a job where I get to see up close how numbers are used by a very particular group of people, politicians. I work at the House of Commons in something called the House of Commons Library, which is the research service to the UK Parliament. And so I'm part of a team of statisticians who provide statistics to MPs and their staff of all political parties. And politicians, as we know, operate in a very fast-paced environment. They have to get to grips with a whole range of different topics from one day to the next. And that comes with a huge demand for data. And so on any given day, we could be asked questions like, how many children in my constituency need free school meals? Or, where does the UK rank globally in defence spending? Or even, how many dogs are there? And are there more than there used to be? And in doing this, I've noticed that while we have good data on lots of things, there are some areas where important areas of policy, such as immigration or crime, poverty, where the data that we have is poor quality or sometimes non-existent. And this is a problem because this kind of bad data is being used to make important decisions. Now, I'm not talking here about the manipulation of good data or about political spin or about fake news. I'm talking about mainly government-produced official statistics that we and politicians should be able to trust. And so I started collecting examples of things going wrong because decisions were made based on bad data. And I'm going to tell you a story. In 2011, the UK had a census, which is a count of the whole population. And what they found was slightly surprising, because it turned out that there were about half a million more people living in the UK than they'd expected to find. And so the statisticians went and looked at their previous estimates, and what they concluded was that our migration estimates had been wrong. How do we measure migration, the migration of people? Well, you might assume that we're counting every single person coming in and out of the country. But that's not the case. And it certainly wasn't back in the 2000s and the 2010s. Back then, our official migration estimates came from a survey at the UK border, which in practice mainly meant airports. And what it looked like is that there would be people standing and uh, doing a survey waiting in the arrivals and departure halls of airports, doing a survey of people coming through and asking them questions and hoping to pick out some international migrants from all of the tourists and other people traveling. And the idea behind it was this. If you're cooking a pan of soup on the stove and you want to check how salty it is, you don't need to drink the whole pan, do you? You can just take a spoonful and... As long as you've stirred it properly, that spoonful should tell you what the level of salt is like in the pan as a whole. And it was the same concept with this passenger survey. The answers of a small random sample of people should tell you something about the scale of migration as a whole. Which was actually working pretty well until 2004. In that year, eight new countries joined the European Union, which the UK was part of at the time. And they brought with them a population of around 73 million people, all of whom now had the right to free movement. And it was around the same time that the budget airline industry was really kicking off. And so you had airlines like Wizz Air, EasyJet and Ryanair. And they were putting on lots of low-cost, affordable flights to smaller regional airports in the UK. 
And so what started happening is that large numbers of people were coming from countries like Poland, Lithuania, and Hungary, arriving in the UK at airports like Leeds, Luton, and Sheffield. The passenger survey, meanwhile, assumed that everybody coming to live and work in the UK would be coming through the main airports of the past, which were predominantly Heathrow and Gatwick. So that's where they stationed everybody to do this survey. And some of those smaller airports weren't even covered by the survey at all. And what that meant was that by the time the statisticians realized migration patterns had changed, it was too late. Hundreds of thousands of people had slipped through their net and not been counted at all. All the while, politicians and those statisticians themselves had been using our official migration statistics without having any idea that they were wrong. And what this all showed is that behind the scenes of what we would assume to be quite robust, solid numbers, there are people scrambling, trying to figure out how to count and measure things in a world where populations are constantly on the move and change is the norm. And looking back, we see a whole catalogue of these kind of policy mishaps due to bad data. When the UK first introduced its state pension over 100 years ago, it ended up being the case that a lot more people came forward to claim it than they were expecting, and then it ended up costing more money. Why? Well, birth registration had only been made compulsory quite recently, and so the government didn't actually have data on people's age. Some people themselves didn't even know their own age and certainly had nothing with which to prove it. Governments want to use data, and that's a good thing. We should be happy about that. But some things are inherently hard to count and measure because they don't have a fixed definition. Take poverty. Poverty is something which governments have been trying to tackle for a very long time. But poverty itself doesn't have a fixed and obvious definition where you can say somebody's gone from being in poverty to out of it, at least from a statistical perspective. When Victorian era social scientists in England first started trying to quantify poverty, they would often take into account things like a person's social class as part of the equation. And that's not something that we'd use now, but at the time it was undoubtedly an important factor. Now, when we measure poverty, we'll tend to do it in economic terms. So we'll talk about a poverty line or relative poverty. And increasingly, people will measure poverty as something multidimensional, which could even include things like the air quality in a place where somebody lives. Unemployment is another indicator which governments are very keen to track, but which actually also resists a fixed definition. During the 1980s, there was a heated political debate in the UK about unemployment. And yet, to this day, we don't actually have a very good idea of what the unemployment rate was like during that time, because the definition of it and the way that they counted it changed more than 30 times. And these type of basic data gaps are bad enough. But now, governments are starting to do more sophisticated things with data, such as using algorithms. Now, in this context, algorithms are just data-driven processes, usually to help decide something or to help allocate something. And they come with problems of their own because feeding bad data into sometimes badly designed algorithms can lead to all sorts of issues. During the pandemic in England, a-level students couldn't sit their final exams, so the government decided to calculate their final grades using an algorithm, which was all fine, until they realized that the algorithm was indirectly discriminating against pupils in poorer, more deprived areas who were seeing their grades disproportionately marked down. The Dutch government had a scandal a couple of years ago which caused the entire government to resign because it turned out that for years they'd been using an algorithm to wrongly accuse people of benefit fraud just because they were dual nationals. And 
the underpinnings of the austerity agenda, the statistical modelling behind that after the financial crisis, turned out to essentially be wrong because the researchers who'd done it, it later turned out, had made a basic error in one of their Excel spreadsheets. Now, all of this has led me to realize that there's one simple key to understanding statistics, and that's that we have to locate the human in the numbers. If there's one thing I want you to take away from this talk, it's that numbers don't count themselves, people do. The way in which we define something determines how we go about counting and measuring it. And the way that we count something can also influence the type of conclusions we draw when we come to look at it. Good data requires proper resourcing. It's not inevitable that we count migration badly or that we don't register births. It's not algorithms themselves which are to blame for being biased or exclusionary. They're just machines acting exactly as we tell them to do. How can we put data in the driving seat and act as if it's somehow objective and independent and neutral when it's entirely shaped by us who create it? I'm fascinated by the world of football statistics. Now, there's a whole industry dedicated to meticulously logging every touch, every pass, every tackle in top-tier football games. And what they do is there are companies which use technology and manual work to generate millions of data points out of every football game. And they use that to calculate things like a player's expected goal rate and to try and predict everything about the outcome of games. Manchester City hired an astrophysicist to lead their data analytics department last season, and wouldn't you know it, they won the league. But what we're seeing happening in football analytics is similar to what's happening in public policy. We're focusing so excitedly on this idea that data can help us crack the code to success that we're starting to lose sight of the human element a bit. We assume now that everything can be quantified, and that by doing that, we will figure out how to improve it. But in football, there are things like the mentality of a team, the drive and the confidence of a particular player that can mean everything. Some players have just got the magic one day, and then it's gone again. And these are things which it's hard to imagine we'll ever be able to quantify. In public policy too, not everything of importance can be distilled into these data sets of ones and zeros. And sometimes we don't even know what it is really that we're supposed to be counting. Why is it important to realize this? Well, frankly, data is not going away. Governments are only going to be using data more and more in policy making. And there's just so much more data out there in the world in general now, partly generated through our use of smart devices and the internet. But there's this huge data divide in the world. There are some areas which are very data rich, and there are others which are riddled with data gaps. There are countries which have incredibly good data on their populations, and others which have practically none. According to UNICEF, one in four children in the world today doesn't exist, on paper at least, in the sense that their birth was never registered. If we don't even have this kind of basic population data, then we're a world away from letting data really do the driving of public policy. And it's still a wild west out there when it comes to the design and use and regulation of algorithms. How many more mistakes do there need to be before we realize that these things need close supervision if we're going to allow them to make decisions for us? I'm going to wrap this up by confessing something to you. I don't really have a maths brain, not really. And yet I work all day with numbers because I've realized what's important for understanding statistics and figuring out whether they're reliable isn't the ability to run complex equations. It's curiosity, it's asking questions, and it's finding the human elements in the numbers. Good data 
takes work. We shouldn't assume that we already have all the answers. And while we're at it, if we're going to be governed by numbers, which increasingly we will, let's not allow it to become a data tyranny. Let's recognize that we're the ones in control.